And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live, and I am not missing. We're broadcasting today from just outside of the Dragon Triangle. If you don't know what that is, I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. Something It's interesting to me. The, the main story, if you go on Drudge Report, if you go to the any of the news outlets online, or if you watch the evening news with Walter Cronkite, uh, you'll hear this story, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, I just noticed something in Romans chapter 7 I, I, that I've never, never noticed before. I've read it. I've talked about it. I've preached on it. But it's just one of those things where every time you pick up a Bible— you become more dangerous to the devil. You do. Every time you pick one up and read it, you find something that you never thought of, that you never considered before. And it's not that it's not there or hasn't been there and God just wrote it in while you weren't looking. It's been there all along. Let me let me give you what I was talking about. Romans 7, I know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman, and we've dealt with this before, our soul inside of us is a woman. And it's that's and I'm getting that from the Bible. I mean word for word from the Bible. Um, I'll look at the verse up if anybody wants to know it. Uh, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. And I like this. And there's many, many different applications to these two verses here. The idea that once my body dies, and it's going to, and on some days I feel like it's going to quickly, and on some days I wish it would faster, but it's going to die. And the millisecond that my body dies, my soul then becomes free. It's no longer trapped. It's no longer in, my soul is no longer in this really bad marriage, all right? Uh, So verse 3, so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now listen to this, and this is what I just, this is brand new to me. Just just thought, just saw it. Wherefore, in verse 4, Romans chapter 7, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised up from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, think of that. We should bring forth fruit unto God. Think of that uh, in relation to John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and my words abide in him. It goes both ways, doesn't it? He that abideth in me, and my words abide in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. Now, it is never left up to the branches to produce the fruit. Never is. It is the vine's responsibility to distribute his words, which is DNA. I want you to think about that. His words, his, his seed, DNA, going into the ends of the branches, the branches blossoming, uh, <clears throat> becoming beautiful, um, and then then eventually those blossoms turn into fruit. And God is the one who produces the fruit in us and on us. But it is not us that makes or manufactures the fruit. You can consider the fruit of a Christian's life. Uh, some people say, well, that's winning souls, or the fruit of a church is... You know, people being saved, I I would accept that on the idea that once you bear fruit, that fruit goes and it produces more vines. So I I accept that. But you you also, Galatians chapter 5, 
Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament. The number nine, number nine, always has to do with bringing forth fruit. Go look in Genesis chapter nine. First, first two verses out of the shoot, God blesses them and says, "Be fruitful and multiply." Uh, fruit bearing. There are nine fruits of the Spirit in the ninth book of the New Testament. Go count them. There's nine there. How old was Sarah when she brought forth fruit? She was 90 years old. What was said of Mary when she was she had conceived the child in her womb, and it was said, uh, "Blessed is the fruit of thy womb." And God had God had told her by way of the angel that what was in her room womb was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Did you know? that in your King James Bibles, in fact, I'm going to show you. I always like to prove what I'm saying because people are going, Hoggard, you're an idiot. I counted it and it came up wrong. Uh, Number one, get a King James. Number two, get the Pure Bible Search software at purebiblesearch.com and you'll have the accurate count. Let me show you what this looks like. We're going to sweep in, sweep this with the besom of destruction here. We're going to type in the phrase H-O-L-Y space G-H-O-S-T, enter. And it's mentioned exactly 90 times in the King James Bible. 90. Why? Because it's the fruit of the Spirit. It is not the fruit, the manufactured fruit of a megachurch. Uh, let me show you. Let me. Speaking of megachurch, let me show you one. I, I don't know that it's a megachurch. I was looking at their profile on Facebook. I think they are a megachurch wannabe. But I want you to look at this particular megachurch wannabe. Take a look at their wording, their symbol. What do you see there? The word thrive. Yeah, okay, I get it. In fact, do this. Do this. Do a Google image search. Type in the phrase thrive church. You're gonna your your eyes are gonna shoot out of your head. Fortunately, my glasses keep mine in. You're going to see one occult symbol after another. If you type in thrive church at images.google.com. You're going to see one after another, including this one, Thrive Church. Look at the logo here. Let me me just kind of show you where I'm going with this. Earth, air, fire, and water. And they're all joining together because there's something right here in the belly button that needs to come out. And it's going to. It's going to. Shoot out of there one of these days when the key unlocks the gate. Um, but anyway, mega churches and mega church wannabes are all about man made fruit. Man made fruit, not letting God do it, not being patient and waiting for God to do it. They do it themselves. Sure, they do. Absolutely, they do. That, is, that was the whole concept behind Rick Warren writing The Purpose Driven Church. It was the idea that we must produce the fruit. We must build the church. We must evangelize. We must bring people in. We must do, 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 do. Rick Warren's church and everybody that follows after him or Bill Hybels or any, any of these other people, they are all about self Production, self-manufacturing. Don't wait on it. Rick Warren says in a purpose-driven church, it is a fallacy to believe that prayer alone can build a healthy church. He's a liar. He's lying right out of his teeth. I don't know if they're real or fake, but he's lying out of them. It is not up, it is not up to us to build the church. Jesus himself said, when Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus said, Peter, 
Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what does that tell you? Number one, it's not my church. Bethel church is not my church. I use that term, my church, because I'm associated with it. I say Bethel is my church in direct contrast to the United Pentecostal Church down the road here. That is not my church. But the fact is, I don't own it. I don't own Bethel. Caleb asked me that question, Dad, who owns the church? I'm going, you know, that's that's a good question, (laughs) you know. I don't own it. It's up to the Lord. God hit me with that years and years ago. Mike, I'm the one who brings people in, and I'm the one who takes people out. That's not you. You just do what I tell you to do. You just preach the word, be instant in, in season, out of season, and I will bring forth the fruit that I want to. You just be good ground is what you do. And so, but these manufactured churches, and I, and I want you to think about this because all this is going to tie in with a theme today, something I tweeted earlier. Uh, I got a couple stories I'm going to read. Oh, by the way, Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to do to you. May you find Jesus near every day of the year. Happy birthday, Jan Jacobs. Oh, happy birthday, Jan Jacobs. She's in the Watchman community. It is her birthday today. It was my sister's birthday yesterday. And she gleefully announced to the entire world that she's turning, she turned 50 nifty, gifty years old. I am two years and two months running behind her. All right. I'll I'll be there. My day's coming. My day's coming. Uh, But anyway, uh, back back to this idea. Uh, He he mentioned here in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 4, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You and I are going to bring forth the fruit unto God. God is the one who issues the fruit. It's his seed. It is his word. It is his nourishing. Paul said, I plant, um, Apollos watereth, God bringeth the increase. Doesn't he? Just think about it. God brings the increase. You know what Monsanto's doing? They're playing God. Monsanto reminds me of the modern day megachurch wannabe movement. Because Monsanto says, we're not going to leave it up to nature anymore. We're going to take over the reins. We are going to make sure that every farm in the world has an abundance of crops. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to let nature do it. We're not going to let God do it. We are going to do it ourselves, and we don't care what it takes. That's what we are going to do. And this is the mindset of the genetically modified churches that are out there. And the reason why I call them genetically modified churches, I'll show you. Some of you probably, yeah, I know where you're going, Pastor, and that's good because I am going in that direction. But they genetically modify these churches for one purpose only, and that is to self-produce in order that the glory could come on themselves and not to God, even though they give God the lip service. I know all about this. I know all about it. I was there a long time ago, was going to do it. And God took a rod after me, and he said, no, you're not. Ooh, okay, I, I won't. Can I, can I at least, God, God, can I, can I at least have a, like a rock and roll band? God, please, please can I have a rock and roll band at the church? No! And you know the funny thing is, I was going to have this band play, and I don't even like the music. I don't like it. But I thought that I had to produce. I thought that I had to do this. I had to perform. I had to, and what it's really all about is that guy that's running the show in these megachurch wannabes, these genetically modified churches, he's wanting Rick Warren's name. He wants to be up there with the big boys who've done something, who has the name, who gets called to the, to the uh, meetings and the seminars. That's what he wants more than anything. So anyway, that's the fruit, the good fruit. And then if you look at the next verse, Romans 7, 5, for when we were in in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, and that's the purpose of the law. The law was given not to save mankind. The law never saved anybody, never did. The law, write this down, 
Mike Hoggard said, the law never saved anybody. Didn't save Paul, did it? And Paul boasted that he probably had more zeal for the law than anybody. He actually referred to himself as, uh, as pertaining to the law, blameless, I believe is what he said. And that leads some people to believe, well, Paul, see, Paul was sinless. He was in the law and he was sinless. No, because when you read Romans 7, Paul does not contradict himself. He clarifies himself. Um, he says, uh, let's see here. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's verse 9. And he mentions later on, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. And that's what he was talking about. He said, I broke the law. I broke the law. Now, I tried to, you know, do the sacrifices and all that stuff, but he said, I broke the law. And so look what happens in verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. This is what jumped out at me a while ago. In verse 4, we have fruit. In verse 5, we have fruit. What is the meaning behind that? In verse 4, it's fruit unto life, fruit unto God. It's living fruit. So think of Genesis chapter 2. Think of the connection that, well, look at when you look in Genesis 2, you have God's commandment, 39 words exactly coming out of God's mouth in our King James Bibles, in Genesis chapter 2. And this is where God tells Adam, don't eat of that fruit. Don't do it. And he said, if you do, you'll die. So he had access to the tree of life, the tree of death. And he says, don't eat of the tree of death. So while Adam was in the garden and he was perfect, he had access to the tree of that brings forth life. And Adam lived. But then Genesis 3 came around and the serpent showed up. And I want to, I, I had this thought, I had this in my notes. I was going through my Evernotes and I looked at this note. It's just a little, little blip of a note. I put Genesis chapter 3 there and I said, it was the devil who first had the idea to modify DNA. It was his idea, and I know that God ordained it. I know that God established it. But the devil was the first one to show up on the scene to say, I'm going to change. I'm going to rewrite that. I'm changing that. I want that. I want that taken out. I want this put in. And you look at what happens in Genesis 3. He says in verse 1, Yea, hath God said. That's it right there. He's questioning God's word. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Then you skip on down, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He just added to the word of God. He just added to it. God said, God said the exact words, Thou shalt surely die in verse 17 of Genesis 2. And then in in verse 4, he said, ye shall not surely die. He adds one word in here, and it changes the entire meaning. He is the first genetic modifier. Verse 5, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, or in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What is it we know about gods? God's Spirits don't die. They don't have mortality. They don't have that. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall not surely die. So he is modifying their genetic structure. He is modifying the word of God as the tempter and the deceiver and Eve literally fell for it. And this is what's going on in science. This is what's going on in the Illuminati. This is the plan, the goal of the Illuminati. This is what's going on in, um, uh, in churches. This is what's happening everywhere. It's funny. 
that you, when you read prophecy books and things like that from you know the 1950s, 60s, 70s, even Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, you don't see a lot in these books about genetic manipulation. That's because we didn't know that much about it in the 60s and the 70s. And we're just kind of getting into the 80s. But by the end of the 90s, into the uh, 21st century, there is an explosion of knowledge of what can be done with DNA. And um, we're going to deal with that. There is, let me read this. I have the link to this story on my Pastor Mike Online Facebook page. You can see the link to it right there. See it? It says, the talk show Hell Hates, Facebook.com, Pastor Mike Online. Okay? They ought to bring back the, you remember in those old cartoons, the bouncing ball, when they would sing songs and they wanted the, the audience to sing songs, they would bounce the ball on the lyrics. They ought to bring that back. I'm surprised some megachurch wannabe doesn't have the bouncing, follow the bouncing ball now on the lyrics, okay? That's because in the megachurch wannabes, there's only like two lyrics in the whole song. They sing it 24,000 times. I was in one of those worship services one time, and they were singing, Let it rain, let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven, let it rain, let it rain. And after, and I'm not kidding you, after the 25th time, I'm just going, would it go ahead and rain already? Good grief. And it kept going and going and going. It's just the, something about what Jesus said. Don't do that. Don't do what the heathen do. Don't have vain repetitions. He said the, the, the heathen think that by their much talking, they can gain access to God. And that, to me, seems like is what the mindset of these people who write this contemporary music. If we say it enough, if we say it over and over and over again, then God will, oh, I, I think they really mean it now because they're like on the 30th stanza here. Anyway, what is going on? In an area of the world noted for what's called the Dragon's Triangle. You've heard of the Bermuda Triangle. There is an area somewhere over there. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's referred to as the Dragon's Triangle. Apparently, and I didn't know this until my son-in-law, Mick, brought it up. And he said, have you heard this going on? He said, have you heard of the Dragon's Triangle? No, I didn't. I just knew of the Bermuda Triangle. I remember reading a book on the Bermuda Triangle when I was, I don't know, probably fifth grade, something like that. But there is a plane that just disappeared. It is gone. It is, it's weird. Because, and I, I did, did some reading on it this morning, just various stories, various articles. Those who have ever dealt with, well, you remember TWA Flight 800. TWA Flight 800 was, I, I think, I think it was a missile. I can't prove it. I think it was a missile. I think that bogus nonsense story that Bill Clinton had these people come up with about, you know, a electrical spark in a gas tank. I don't buy it. I think it was a missile. There were people who saw, yeah, there's, you know, that's what we saw. And it makes you wonder during the Clinton administration, who was on that plane and what did they know? Just kind of interesting to me. But TWA Flight 800, they eventually was able to piece together most of this airplane in a hangar. How did they do that? They were able to pinpoint the location where the bits and pieces of the plane landed because there was floating debris. In this case, let me read this story. High strangeness. Mystery thickens over missing flight MH370. Uh, International Business Times reports that 19 families have signed a joint statement saying that passengers' cell phones connected after the flight had been reported missing. In each case, the phone would ring, but the call would be hung up. 
the sister of one of the Chinese passengers among the 239 people on board the missing flight rang his phone live on TV twice at 1140 on Sunday morning and heard it ringing. She called again later that afternoon and heard it ring once more. The mirror reports that she uh, expressed her hope that if the cell went through, police could locate the position. A man from Beijing also called his missing brother and reported to the airline that the phone connected three times and rang before appearing to hang up. Relatives who signed the joint statement have asked uh, Malaysia Airlines to reveal any information that may have been hiding. The airline has not released any further details regarding the aircraft. However, Malaysian Minister of Transport Transport Hishamuddin Hussein, another Hussein guy. Now we got a conspiracy. Um, said they were doing everything in their power to locate the plane and that they hope people understand that they are being as transparent as they can. In the meantime, it has also been reported that the, lar that the large oil slick spotted in the South China Sea was found to be a bunker, bound it, was found to be bunker fuel and not that of missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370. These eerie happenings have, of course, given rise to a number of conspiracy theories, one of which purports that the aircraft may have been hijacked by terrorists bearing fake passports. It's possible. And, uh, and is now secretly stationed at an abandoned Vietnamese airport at this very moment. According to Citizens News Sites, beforeitsnews.com, the aircraft may have been landed safely by terrorists or hijackers uh, to later be used as a weapon of mass destruction with passengers and crew now being held as hostages. I have a question. I have a legitimate question. Where did the airplane go? Where did it go? It's weird. No flotsam, no jetsam, no floating i mean the air the the cushions they always tell you you know in, you know in case uh, you know we land in water which we're not supposed to do you can use your seat bottom as a flotation device and that's what usually you see in a crashed airplane you know pieces of the seat coming up they don't see it anywhere the plane just is gone what happened to it did it go through a stargate who knows um, it's just very interesting that a plane disappears apparently without any trace whatsoever. I don't understand that. So, you know me. I think we ought to look in the Bible for something similar to that if, if, if it's real. Uh, was it harp? I don't know. Who knows what harp does? All right. Uh, you common core adversaries. Here is a, this is uh, from Breitbart.com. Common core woes lead to new dumbed down SAT. You know what the SATs are, don't you? SAT is the, um, Strategic or Scholastic Aptitude Test or something like that. It's a standardized college entrance exam. I remember taking, was it the ACT or the SAT I took? I don't remember. I did okay. I did all right. Okay. I mean, I got, I, I passed. Hillsdale Free Will Baptist College accepted me. I don't know how well, I don't remember how well I did. I knew I went to high school with a guy, graduated the same year I did. He's now, I think, a medical doctor of some kind, Jewish. Basically beat the test, okay? Scored the max amount on just about every part of it. And I'm going, oh, really? Anyway, here is what was interesting. I'm going to use some high-tech graphics here. I'm going to put this up on the screen here so you can see it. Seek action that illuminates. Is this guy in the Illuminati? Doesn't have to be. All he has to be is lost. Uh, here's, here's what this story is about, and it's interesting. Those of you who are adversaries to Common Core, and I am, they changed how they teach young people. Lisa and I were frustrated every night. 
when Caleb would come home from the public education system with homework that Lisa and I, who have been college educated, would look at and shake our heads and scratch our heads and say, I don't have the first clue what this is. I have no idea what they're I, I she, Lisa would bring it to me. Can you make sense out of this? I'm going, uh, well, you know, because I'm wanting to I'm wanting to be, you know, I'm the man. I'm smarter. I'm far more intelligent than my wife. And I'm looking at, well, yeah, it's um, uh, you, you're supposed to see. Um, um, well, just, just do it. Just sit down and do it. It's that easy. I couldn't figure it out. So they've got a generation of youngins coming up with Common Core, this liberal, progressive, right-brained, um, academic, scholastic, whatever. It's not about knowledge by rote. It's not about learning the facts. It's not about two plus two equals four. It's not about that. It's about how you imagine, how you visualize, how you can create this, how you can feel that. That's what it's about. That, we, we have common core churches now. They've altered the curriculum, and now they are common core. Now they're going to illuminate everybody with this creativity nonsense. That's the Thrive Church. But anyway, so they got this generation of kids coming up in this public school system that is being common core. So what, what do you have to do? You have to alter the college entrance exams so that can take place. So the article says, and this is from uh, Breitbart.com, it is no accident that the so-called architect of the Common Core Standards is now president of the college board. Barack Obama's plan to, quote, fundamentally transform education into the latest social justice iteration has hit a roadblock and David Coleman has come to save the day with a newer dumbed down SAT so easy that almost anybody can get into college. Um, Ze'ev Werman, a former U.S. Department of Education official under President G.W. Bush, served in 2010 on the California Academic Content Standards Commission that evaluated the suitability of Common Core Standards for California. One of the first things David Coleman promised when he uh, assumed the president of the college board was to align the SAT with the Common Core. In other words, they knew that they were, when all these kids, all these Common Core kids hitting the college age level, these people knew they wouldn't pass the test. So instead of training them to pass the test, you change the test so that how you're training them, they will pass it. That's what you do. You take a high standard and you lower it way down so that it has the least common denominator. Think about the church. Think about what they're doing with all the new Bible translations. We're going to dumb down the Bible. We're going to bring, who can bring God down from heaven? Nobody can. But we're going to try. We're going to bring, God has a high standard. Did you know that God has high standards? You know how high God's standards are? Most. That's how high his standards are. He is the most high God. You cannot get above the most high God. There is only one who thought it not robbery to be equal with the most high God, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of the most high God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There is someone, however, who wants to be like the most high God. Take a wild guess at who it is. Okay. Now, Barack Obama, that's too high. Okay. That's too wild. It was Lucifer. He wants to be like the Most High. So, God has a high standard as far as what he calls perfect. What God calls holy is the highest 
of all standards in the universe. There isn't anything above God's standard of holiness. God requires absolute obedience, no failure whatsoever. You cannot break the least of the laws given by God in the Old Covenant. You cannot do that. Not one. So God has a high standard. God And only Jesus could satisfy that high standard. Because where did he come from? Most high. And so what do we see happening? God has a standard for perfection. He says, this, my word, is perfect. It's pure. It has no defilement, no corruption in it whatsoever. None, zero. Paul in Romans 7, he said, oh, I'm full of it. I am full of corruption. I'm rotten in my core, in my flesh. I'm messed up. God has a high standard. God says, my word, if you're going to call it my word, my word has no mistakes in it whatsoever. That's my word. That's what God said. Man brings God down way, 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 way down here. God even exalted his word above what? His name. And so man says, you know, we, let's rewrite the Bible because that's too high for everybody. Let's just bring it down to a level where everybody can, can be like God. Everybody can be this way. Everybody can do this. Everybody can do that. Let's bring God down here. Let's bring the standards down. And that's what they're doing. We have common core genetically modified churches. I was going to be one. I was going to dumb down. I'm not kidding you. I, I'm not kidding you. I was, I was going to, um, I had a collection of Amway tapes that a guy was giving me because I wanted to learn how to do this positive sales speech seminar thing so I could bring excitement to the church. I, I'm not making that up. I was messed up back then. God brought me out. So they're going to illuminate everybody. Let me get that in front of the camera there. Seek action that illuminates. They're going to illuminate everybody by lowering the standards. And let me tell you, let me tell you what a high standard does for you. Because here, here's, here's my thing. I have always, my life, I, I I've always been conservative. I had, you know, this little liberal thing that I wanted to do back in the early to mid 90s and God chasing that out of me. But for the most of my life, I've been conservative. That means you have high standards. That means I don't show up for church with shorts and flip flops on and a Hawaiian shirt. I don't do that. I don't think that's right. And I, I, I try to have high standards. My problem is I usually end up breaking my own standards. In my youth, I would always try to point out people who were not following my standards. Why don't you do this? How come you don't do that? Well, you said you're a Christian and you don't, you're not doing this. I would always point out everybody that wasn't accommodating my high standards and I went through college this way. And then God brought me to a point in my life where God said, see that finger? Yeah, I'm pointing at everybody. God went, guess who's, not, guess who's not keeping their own standards? That would be me. I believe in high standards. God has a high. So what does a high standard do for you if you can't attain to it? If you cannot achieve sinless perfection and you are not going to as far as your flesh in this world is concerned. Don't let anybody lie to you. You are not going to be sinless and perfect in this life. The only thing that can be is the hidden man inside of you, the seed of the Word of God. That's the only thing that can be perfect in you. That's the only thing that does not sin. First John tells us that. That which is born of God sinneth not. But that which is born of woman sins. So anyway, what does that high standard do for us? You know what it does? 
it, it enables us to cling to the one who achieved the high standard. That's what it does. It would be like, and I want you to, I want you to ponder this. Let's say that in the, in, in the next <clears throat> Olympic Games, let's say they're held in America. Let's say the next set of, of, of summer Olympic Games are held in America. Barack Obama is still president, and all these liberals are running everything in the world, including the Olympics. So a guy runs a, uh, I don't know, a 300-meter a foot race, and he's got 20 guys tailing him. And this guy, he not only breaks the record and comes in first. I mean, he demolishes the record for running, what, a 300-meter race. Four of the guys in the back fell and never finished the race. Under this socialism, common core, let's dumb everything down and bring it down level, everybody who ran the race would get to be on the podium and get a gold medal. All of them would. Because we lowered the standard. We lowered the standard. We dropped it. I heard, I heard my son Caleb's playing basketball in the YMCA. He's getting better at it. I mean, he's scoring points and he's knowing what to do. He's thinking basketball way. And I heard a woman behind me at a recent game saying, well, I don't think they should keep score anyway. I don't think they should. Really? The only reason why you say that is because your kid's getting beat. Our team scored 20 points and your kid scored, what, five? That's the only reason why you're saying that. I disagree with that 100%. I think they ought to keep score in every child's football game, baseball game, soccer game, basketball game, backgammon game, whatever it is, I think they should keep score. Let me tell you, let me tell you what being an underachiever is good for. It forces us to rely upon Jesus Christ for everything. If I was good enough to not only uphold in my mind high standards, but live by them, then I would be achieving righteousness in and of myself, but not honoring God. I can only have the righteousness that is imputed to me as a believer like Abram was. That is the only righteousness that I can have because I tend to be an underachiever. It's not that I don't want to. It's just that I find myself like Paul. What I want to do, that ain't what I did. And what I don't want to do, that's what I did. So leave this. When, when someone says, you know, they just took the Bible and they rewrote it so that, you know, they brought it down to everybody's level. I could read Norman Vincent Peale and get it on everybody's level. I could read, um, what's his name? Tony Robbins. I could go to one of his seminars and fluff myself up. No, God has a high standard, and I want it to be the highest of all standards, and I understand that I cannot attain to it, so I'm going to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ so that when he wins the prize, I win the prize. That's the offer made to you. A red dragon is going to visit Mars. Did you know that? A red dragon... Uh, Red Dragon could visit Mars in proposed NASA mission. This print is so small. I got to look at the very bottom millimeter of my glasses to read it. I don't know why my printer is doing that. Is there life on Mars? NASA is still trying to find out, discovering evidence of water in a Martian meteorite. Let me shorten this story. Uh, back in 2011, NASA proposed using a modified SpaceX Dragon capsule dubbed Red Dragon 
to deliver equipment to the Martian surface as a landing craft. Most recently, however, NASA has been looking for ways to bring samples uh, collected by rovers, particularly the uh, upcoming Mars 2020 rover. I didn't know they had a new rover coming out. Um, anyway, NASA has this infatuation with a cult. That, I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Apollo, Gemini, Mercury, Columbia, Red Dragon, okay, X-33. They got an infatuation with it. Now, here's I'm going to segue into, let me make sure I mention everything. Oh, here's what I was getting at a while ago. Uh, the link to some of the stories I have is on this page right here. Facebook.com, Pastor Mike Online. Go on there. It's a public page. Uh, leave any comments you want. I don't care. Okay? You can say nice things about me or you can say really mean things about me. I, on that part of my Facebook page, uh, I have not imposed any rules as of yet. Now, on my personal Facebook page, you can't get ignorant. Okay? And I don't like you advertising somebody else's stuff on my Facebook page. But the Pastor Mike Online, knock yourself out. All right? Here's an article that was in my Evernotes. Eternal life does not violate the laws of physics. We will be gods. Um, in his best-selling book, Physics of the Future, American professor Michio Kaku, you know who that is? He's that Japanese-looking physicist that's always on all these shows and being interviewed all the time uh, as you know, for physics and things like that. Uh, Morgan Freeman is narrating a thing called Through the Wormhole. Um, I watched part of the new Cosmos series. I didn't see him on there yet, but I'm sure he'll show up at some time. Anyway, American professor Michio Kaku lays out his vision for the world in 2100. Kaku, the son of Japanese ignorance, immigrants. What is wrong with my tongue today? The son of Japanese ignorance. That's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say was immigrants. Some would say, Hoggard, your Freudian slip is showing. That, get, that gets a... There we go. The son of Japanese immigrants spoke to Der Spiegel about a future in which toilets will have health monitoring sensors Ugh. and contact lenses will be connected to the Internet. That is like right around the corner. They're working on that one right now. I'm not making that up. Professor Kaku, in your book, you write about how we will be like gods in the future. This is Der Spiegel spricken. Are you saying that our grandchildren will be gods? Isn't that... Uh, uh, isn't that a bit immodest? Kaku says, just think for a moment about our forefathers in the year 1900. They lived to be 49 years old and average uh, on average and traveled with horse-drawn wagons. Long-distance communication was yelling out the window. If these people could see us today with mobile phones at our ears, Facebook on our screens, and traveling with planes, they would consider us wizards. Der Spiegel says, it's still a big step to go from wizards to gods. Kaku. So what do gods do? Apollo has unlimited power from the sun. Zeus can turn himself into a swan or anything else. And Venus had a perfect body. Gods can move objects with their mind, rearrange things, and have, a, have perfect bodies. Our grandchildren will be able to do just that. Think about it. And I don't think he's lying. I don't think he's just dreaming out of the side of his head. I think he's telling a little bit about what he knows is going on in this world. Now, is, um, is um, uh, Michio Kaku, the son of Japanese ignorance, immigrants, excuse me, is he in the Illuminati? It doesn't matter. All he has to do is be lost. That's all he has to do. Why do we keep saying that? Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible talks about... Um, the print, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There is a spirit, the zeitgeist, the Germans call it, the spirit of the day that is leading people, all of mankind, to go. It's a dragon. He's a red dragon. 
So why not honor and, and get this that that article? I just I just got it. The idea that we're going to send a red dragon to the highest place that we have ever tried to go to, the planet Mars. Think about it. Here is the great red dragon Lucifer saying, I will be like the most high. Seven words he speaks there at the last. Go count them in your King James Bible. But there is a spirit working in the children of men right now, the children of disobedience, that is trying to bring people to a new era, a new world, a brave new world. It's trying to enlighten them somehow. Again, you go back 40, 50 years ago, read some of the prophecy books by written by good men. I'm not dogging these people at all. They were working with the information that they had at the time. But no one ever really conceived of the idea that they were going to change people's DNA. It wasn't until... We started hearing stuff and the explosion of the internet. Now we have all of this, uh, we have all of this information available to us instantly in the palm of our hand. Now we're learning things that we never knew before. Now we're looking at what's going on in the world and we're examining it in the light of the scriptures, and we're seeing that not only is that what man has planned. God saw it before the foundation of the world. And I, I absolutely believe that all of the advancements in science, medicine, biology, astrophysics, physics themselves, looking for the God particle, everything like that, I think devils are illuminating. Where is that story? I think devils are illuminating the minds of people of this generation so that we can learn how to do it. In other words, I think the real Illuminati are spirits that are trying to bring man to the place where they're trying to teach man how to build his own temple. You go to the House of the Lodge, um, House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. You look on the outside, and what it says is Masonry builds its temples in the hearts of men. And I want you to I want you to think about that. I, I'm gonna cover some material. Oh, by the way, let me show you this. This is the um, this is the megachurch wannabe. Um, it's called the Thrive Church. You see this, earth, air, fire, and water. I'll probably use this in the Watchmen sometime. So I can't remember who it was sent it to me. I appreciate it. You're about to be famous. <laughs> just kidding. Okay? But I, I like it. It, it just uh, it speaks volumes to me. And th- there is a, he was doing a sermon series. And I know this is a little bit hard to read, but it's called Goliath Givers or Giver. Goliath Giver. What does that mean? Give like a giant. Give like a boss. I want you to get what he said. Here is here is now a mega church wannabe guy. You see the drums? Oh, we got the drums. We got the guitar. We're gonna dumb dot God down. We're gonna read the mess edge Bible, and we're gonna show up in our t-shirt and our flip flops, drinking coffee, and I'm gonna preach to you a series on how you can give me more money. And we're going to equate it like you were Goliath. You are a hybrid species of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And you have six fingers and six toes. And you're six cubits in a span. And you blaspheme God. That's what we want you to do. We want you to be Goliath givers. We want you to be Goliath. We want you, as Joel Osteen says, discover the champion in you. The only place in the whole Bible, the the King James Bible, uses the word champion. 1 Samuel 17, the Philistines had a champion, Goliath of Gath. And look at, some of you have spotted it already, the Illuminati triangle 
made out of $1 bills. Isn't that interesting? Or is that $100 bills? I don't know. Goliath giving. Very, very interesting to me. Now, let me do this. Um, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take a, like a 10-second break here, and um, I'm going to turn my air conditioner on. It is steaming hot in here now. We woke up this morning. Uh, the temperature was a nice, cool 40-some-odd degrees. And yesterday was, uh, yesterday was awesome. Yesterday it got up to like 79 degrees. I think today is going to be the same thing. It is absolutely gorgeous here at our Top Secret Broadcasting compound. The problem is sometime tomorrow the temperature is going to drop some 50 degrees. I'm not making that up. It's going to drop about 50 degrees. We're going to Wednesday night it's supposed to rain and then change to snow. Okay? Only in the Midwest can you get weather like that. Within within 12 hours time the temperature is going to go from like 82 degrees down to, down to uh, I think like 28 degrees, something like that. Unreal. Unreal. This is a picture of the Wilderness Tabernacle. Back when, um, back when Gary was traveling with Moses, he took this picture. That gets a, uh, there we go. He took this picture of the wilderness tabernacle. I had this in my mind. I just, I just want to, I want to talk about this. I want to cover some of the, some of the material that we've passed out in the in in recent years, but just kind of look at it from a from a fresh perspective, and get an idea of what the Bible is trying to tell us now about what's going to happen. Remember, the Bible gives us the glasses to be able to see into the future. Is what it does. The Bible gives us the ability to see afar off, to see, to look as Abraham did, look to the mountains of Moriah and see the place afar off. He's looking on the third day into the future is what he's seeing into the future. This is a typological event. All these things are written that were written aforetime, were written for our learning, for our knowledge, for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. I still don't know what that phrase means, the ends of the world. Why is it plural? I don't know what that means yet. So I'm going to keep looking. But anyway, um, Moses built a tabernacle. God told him, Moses, you see what I've got going on up here? Moses said, yeah. God said, what you build down there needs to match What's up here? And you think about that. That is a general rule. Uh, Think of what Jesus prayed. Uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, they must match. So he says, uh, uh, Moses, take a look at what I'm showing you here, the tabernacle and the laver and the altar and uh, the, uh, the incense and the candles and the table and the throne and take a look at it because I want you to build that exact replica, a three-dimensional shadow of a heavenly thing. And so God gave Moses the directions on how he wanted him to do, how he wanted him to hang the curtains God gave him precise directions on how to hang the curtains on there. And we're being told by the megachurch wannabes that, oh, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us how to do it. It just says do it. That's not right. The man of God can be thoroughly furnished and do all good works from all Scripture, which is given by inspiration of God. So he tells Moses, this is how I want you to do it. If God, I'm telling you this. If God tells you to do something, he's going to tell you how to do it. He's not going to leave it up to your own devices, your own imagination, your own thinking. I've been through that. I know that my ideas don't work. God makes sure they come crashing down or they disappear like an airplane in Asia. God wants it done his way. So he says, Moses, build this 
my way. Do it exactly the way that I tell you to. So what is that way? Well, here, take a look at this now. Here's we're going to go through this. This is the outer gate or the outer uh, covering. And all of the children of Israel are all out here. Only the Levites can come in here. Only the Levites. And at that, there's only one Levite who can go all the way back here. Only one. And that is the high priest. So here's the labor. Here's the altar. There was inside of here an altar of incense. And inside of here on this side, this is, let's see, this is south. Um, it has the, um, the seven candles, the menorah, as they call it. It's being fed by oil, and, it, and it's the only light on the inside of here. That's it. So the, And it stays lit 24 hours of the day. Then over here on the north side is the table of showbread. By the way, this menorah represents the seven spirits of God. The seven, read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and you'll see the seven spirits of God. They're there. So that's what this so here's the Holy Spirit here. Right here is the table of showbread, 12 fresh baked loaves of bread. Oh, that must have been good. Uh, there on a table. God said uh, in or excuse me, David said in Psalm 23, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. This is the north side. Christ was crucified on the north of Jerusalem. There is a constellation in the sky called Draco. It's the dragon. It's in the north. Where did God say the terror was going to come from? The nation uh, of, of uh, the language that you don't understand. The nation of fierce countenance. Where are they going to come from? The north. The, our enemies are up in the north. And God prepared for us a table right in the presence of our enemies. And God said, hey, sit down. Sit down and eat. But God, our enemies are right there. Don't worry about it. I got them. And I want, I want your enemies to see that I will take care of you and I will protect you and I'm going to give you so much peace that instead of you standing there cowering in fear, I'm going to have you sit down and break bread right in front of them as if you have no fear. Because what, I mean, think about it. What's the first thing that happens when we feel fear? Our stomach turns to knots. I've never had anybody say, man, I, I am scared to death. I don't know what to go. What, I don't, I'm so scared. I, I just want to eat a hamburger and some Chinese food and a pizza and some ice cream and a hot dog. And so, nobody does that. When you have fear, you have incapable of eating. And God says, sit right here at this table, and I'm going to feed you 12 fresh baked loaves of bread, which were who? Jesus. He said, I'm the bread of life. And then back here, you have, you have another curtain. You have a curtain here. You have another curtain here. This is called what? And if you said the Holy of Holies, you're wrong. Yeah, but, you know, it, you're talking about right there. We're the other in the Ark of the Covenant. That's the Holy of Holies. You're wrong. That, look, look it up. In fact, here, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's pull up the software, sweep it with the besom of destruction, and let's type in holy of holies. Donna did such a good job with this software that it automatically lets you know what phrase is not there or what word is not there. She put a strike through through the word holies here. The, the software does it automatically. If it's not there... You know about it. That phrase, Holy of Holies, does not exist in the King James Bible. What is it called? The most holy place. See, I win. Okay? That's the most holy place. Now watch this. Here's what I'm going to show you. I had a friend back in, um, I can't remember, 2000. 2000, 2001, somewhere around in there, Chuck Thurston. I've mentioned him before. Uh, great guy. Him and his wife, we fellowship with him several times. He kind of, he, we don't see eye to eye on everything. Nobody does. But he introduced me to the idea because of his background as a doctor, which I'm not, a medical doctor. 
it occurred to him that the wilderness tabernacle was an image of the human cell. And I'm going to show you that. Hang on here. There, there we go, right here. Here is this. Oh, you can't see it yet. Hang on. Here we go. Here's the cell wall. This is the curtain around the tabernacle structure. You know what this is? This is the most holy place. See, I got it right. This is where the throne is. This is where the mercy seat is, and there's something else in here. And I'll show it to you in a little bit. Some of you already know this. But here's, your, here's the curtain, and there's only a few select, very limited things that can get inside of this curtain. Um, just like with, let me scroll back this way here, just like with this, there's only a few things that can ever get into that curtain. So here we have the, the cell wall, which is the curtain. We have the tabernacle and the most holy place. And we have a bunch of gooey stuff that's going on out here. What you have, I think, right here. It's hard to see that. Yeah, I think this is it. This is called the mitochondria. You know what the mitochondria does? Let me, let me explain it to you. You have, a, you have a, a, a chemical in your body called insulin. Okay, I have a problem with insulin. Okay, my body doesn't want to produce as much insulin as I did in the good old days. All right, so I got to boost it a little bit. I'm taking medicine right now, and probably someday I'll just be shooting myself with insulin. Okay, I hope not, but that's, you know, it's what happens. And so anyway, insulin is like a Levite priest. This is so cool. Your body takes everything that you eat and eventually breaks it down into sugar. Okay? That's neat. And think about this. Everything that you eat has DNA. Rocks don't have DNA, and we don't eat rocks. Okay? Dirt doesn't have DNA. We don't eat dirt. Forks do not have DNA, and we don't eat the forks. But when you have meatballs on your spaghetti, meatballs were made out of DNA. The marinara sauce was made out of DNA. The spaghetti noodles were made out of DNA. The hamburger was made. The buns were made out of wheat, which have DNA. In fact, buns literally are just nothing but DNA. You're eating wheat seeds. You're eating DNA. The hamburger in there, the cow has DNA. It's in his muscles. Even, even if you eat head cheese, don't eat head cheese. Even if you eat head cheese, everything that's packed in head cheese has DNA in it. This is so cool. Okay? So your body takes in things that are made out of DNA, and we convert them to sugar. You know what the Bible says? The entrance of thy words giveth light. Your body feeds on DNA. It feeds on words. What does your soul feed on? This right here. So watch this. Some of you out there, you can't, you don't like me because I say King James Bible, King James Version. I believe any translation, you read any translation, okay, really? And some of you same people don't like it because I go to McDonald's every now and then. Oh, Pastor, you're not you're not supposed to eat that. That's that's bad for you. That's you know that's that's going to harm you. You know it's going to do this and it's going to do that. And and uh, you know you should you should eat a a healthy diet. I I get it. I I'm with you. I get it. Okay, and I'm in the process of training my brain to not want to eat junk stuff. I'm in the maintenance phase of life. I'm really going to have to keep this body going for a while. I got to do something, all right? Little yard work doesn't hurt either. But anyway, 
What do you think your soul's feeding on? Does it? You, you, what you're saying is it's all important what your body eats, but it's not important what your soul eats. You, you're your religion is backwards, is what it is. You're not thinking right. You're you're worshiping the creature more than the creator. You're saying that we really need to be careful about what we eat, and we shouldn't eat any genetically modified organisms, and I'm there with you, sister and brother. But when it comes to the Bible... Any translation is a good translation. They're all bad anyway, so why bother? That's your attitude, and your, and your attitude's wrong. It is more important for you eternally to make sure that what you're eating in your soul is not genetically modified. And the same spirit that runs Monsanto... Monsanto spends billions of dollars every year making sure that no government, especially this government, no government lets the cat out of the bag as to what they're doing with the genetically modified organisms. Monsanto says you do not have a right to know what we're doing to the food you eat. After all, we're not hurting you. It's all the same. In fact, in fact, here we go. The food that we make is better than what you would grow in your own yard. Isn't that what you heard about all these fake Bibles? Oh, they're better. They're better than the King James. Trust us. Eat it. Eat it. So anyway, your body eats DNA. Your body eats DNA, and your body then, the entrance of thy words giveth light. So your body takes in this hamburger, which is pure DNA, and you eat it, and your body converts it into sugar, which is energy. The entrance of thy words giveth light. So sugar, watch this now. The Levite priests are the only ones who can take in the animal sacrifices. And every sacrifice that was brought into the tabernacle had to have DNA, didn't it? You could not bring uh, to the Levite priest, Aaron, Aaron's standing there at the door. He's in his course, and you bring Aaron a picnic basket full of gravel and say, here, uh, brother priest, uh, this is my sacrifice to God. You can't do that. Why? It didn't have DNA. And so they brought in animals. Animals have DNA. They brought in grain and fine flour and wheat, and that has DNA. That's what was acceptable to be brought in. So what would they do? They would take, the priests would take that, and they would break it up. They would cut it in pieces and put this piece over here. The priests could keep part of it. And then they would take that. They would put it on an altar. And what would they do with it? Would they drown it? No. What would they do? Burn it. And what happens when you light a fatted cow on fire? There's light that comes out of the fire. Isn't that neat? The entrance of thy words giveth light. And so your body takes in words. It takes in stuff with DNA and can breaks it down into sugar and because thy words are sweeter than honey to me. Got it right. Thy words are sweeter than honey and it converts it to sugar and the Levite priest, which is insulin, opens the door here and so the sugar, the sacrifices with DNA can go in and they can be burned on the mitochondria altar. And as that's being burnt on the altar, energy and light is being infused into this cell and that cell can live. Isn't that awesome? And then, see all this little stuff here, like the like 
like the sort of whitish area right in here. You see that? Let me go back to this picture here. Okay. Here's the altar. That's the mitochondria. Here's the cell wall. The priest stands here and says, I'll take that food in. You can't take it in yourself. You're not worthy. And so, and, and with me, my Levite priests that are supposed to open the door and let the sugar in, they're lazy. Or they just, there's not enough of them left. Okay. And so I need to hire some more Levite priests. Need some help. Okay. Read, um, Read has read the story about Hezekiah. But anyway, so my Levite priests are lazy and they won't open the door. So instead of that sugar going into my cells where it's needed, it just floats around in my bloodstream. Okay? And I get really, really tired. So anyway, here is here is the altar. Here is the laver. Okay. You know what the word laver? You ever seen the word lavatory? I'm not being disgusting. A lavatory is a wash room. And that's commonly what we call it. We call, uh, excuse me, I have to be dismissed to the wash room. We don't call it what we're really going to do in there. Okay. Um, or may I, may, may I be excused to the bath room? That's where we take a bath. Okay. But in ships and on planes and boats and things like that, it is a lavatory. And this is the laver. There was water here. And this water was there for washing, for cleansing, for making things look nice and neat and polished. But anyway, that's where they stored the water. Before you could go into here, you had to wash here. God's a clean God. Amen. God is a very, very clean God. So look at this. Here is your mitochondria. Oh, excuse me, your cell. Here's your mitochondria. Here's the most holy place. And all of this here is the laver. This is where water is stored in the tabernacle. I, I'm, I, I love this. Chuck, if you're listening, I don't, I'm not sure if you are, but if Chuck, thank you for being obedient to the Holy Spirit and showing a guy like this who doesn't know much about science and medicine, and I get it. I absolutely get it, and I love it, all right? Inside the tabernacle, we talked about this. Here's the table of showbread, the menorah. And then behind this curtain, you have the most holy place. It's 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits, which is 1,000 cubic cubits. This is where God's throne is. He reigns in the 1,000 cubic cubits room. It's a picture of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. This is what it is. It's so beautiful. It's perfect. That's why God said, Moses, build it the way I show you. Do it exactly how I tell you to do it. And you, when you get ready to move that Ark of the Covenant, you better have four Levite priests with that on their shoulders because that matches what's in heaven. And if you don't do it right, because David's going to put it on an ox cart and I'm going to kill Uzzah because of it you got to do it the way I told you to do it. God has a high standard. So now watch this, okay? Here's what God said. Deuteronomy 31, 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book. Some of you know where we're going. David said, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God wrote a book. And just do a study. Here, here's what you do. Uh, get the Pure Bible Search software and type in the word. Oh, let's do this. Let me show you this. J-E-S-U-S-C-H-R-I-S-T. Jesus Christ. 196 times in the King James Bible. That's 7 times 7 times 4 four Gospels. Now type in Son of Man, 196 times, seven times seven times four. Type in the word book and put an asterisk. It's either, see, Donna, I love you. She put down here the possible suggestions, book or books. That's the only two form forms that you see in the Bible. It doesn't have booking or bookler or 
or Bookingly or uh, Bookette or anything. It's book or books. And so you type that in, hit enter, and it's 196 times exactly. Jesus, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, book or books. They're perfect. They're all, they're one and the same. They are the same. So, and think about the phrase, son of man. Man has DNA. So you look at the word book, it's the book of life, and the, and the word of God grew and multiplied. I mean, it's, it's all there. But watch this now. Here's what, here's what God told Moses to do. Let me find, where is it here? Here we go. Uh, let me click this. Now you can see it. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book. And the rules were, you cannot add to it. You cannot diminish aught from it. Don't add to, don't take away the words of the book. Here's what Moses did with the book. He wrote the words of this law in a book until they were finished. In other words, it was complete. That Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So here's what they did. They took that book and they put it inside the the Ark of the Covenant. And he said that it's a witness against you. Now, I want to show you what that means. This is really neat. The Bible teaches us that if we Gentiles do things that are contrary to the law, and the law wasn't given to us, we're actually saying the law is good. We consent that the law is good. So we have, we have the witness of God in us, in our DNA. Let me show you this right here. This is your DNA, and it's in these little X-looking things called chromosomes. See how it's twisted and turned here? This, this actually is not accurate on how DNA is turned. But from, from one, let me, let me pull my picture up here so you can see my high-end graphics here. If, if you take any point in the DNA and you look at how it's curved here, and you find that exact same curve down the road here, one helical turn. In other words, it starts turning, and it comes back around again to its starting point up here. In one helical turn of DNA, you have 10 of these little ladder rungs there. What does that mean? Think of the number 10. What does it mean? 10 commandments. God literally encoded his law into us. And if you don't believe that, number one, that's what God said. Number two, every, just about every culture, not all. There are a few exceptions in some cultures that are very far removed from normal humanity. But in practically every culture in the world, they know what adultery is, and it's wrong. It's wrong for a man to have another man's wife. They know what stealing is. They have laws against stealing. They have laws against killing someone. Every culture, every civilization. Laws against killing someone. Laws against lying. Laws against um, um, dishonoring your parents. In some cultures, it's stronger than others. But as Paul said, every time I sin, I consent that the law is good. We know that we have the law in us telling us this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. So Moses took the book and he put it in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the final stop for Aaron the high priest. When Aaron went in, let me, uh, let's see if I can find that picture here for you real quick. When Aaron went in to the most holy place, let's see, here it is right here. When Aaron went in here, that was it. This is the west. This is the east. And by the way, everything in the tabernacle goes from east to the west. Isn't it interesting that David, when writing Psalm 19, said that the sun going in his circuits was like a like he had God had built and put the sun in a tabernacle. 
the space and the heavens were the tabernacle, and the sun goes from east to west, and everything in the tabernacle goes from east to west. Here's God right here at the west. And Moses, Aaron the high priest would walk in once a year with the blood of the atonement and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat seven times where the law was. Now watch that. That is a picture. Let me show you this. Okay, Moses took the law and put it in the ark in the most holy place. In the middle of your cell in the nucleus, you have this. This is the book, Psalm 139. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. I want you to take a look at this. And I'm going to compare it to that. Let's do that. Take a look at that. Now take a look at that. What do you see? I see something very identical. I see a cross here. And by the way, when we look at this again, we can see earth, air, fire, and water, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So when the occultists and the witches and the uh, shampoo commercial, when they talk about rising up out of the elements, what are those elements as far as the human body is concerned? Those elements are our DNA. We've got something in us that's not good. It's a no good thing. And it's literally encoded in our DNA. Again, if anybody tells you, oh, you're a Christian, you've got to be sin. I believe in sinless perfection. And, and I believe it's commanded us that we, that we obey everything that God said. Just try it. Try it. Try going. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you... I don't know, three weeks. Try to going three weeks without committing one sin. You know what's going to happen? You're either going to say, uh, yeah, you know, I, Hoggy, I see what you're saying. I, I, can't, I can't be perfect. I tried. I cannot be perfect. Either, you're either going to admit it or you're going to say, well, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. All right, we got to do this again I, not, so I can be ready for it. We'll try to excuse it somehow or we'll say, I didn't sin. That that was not sin. It's not, no, huh, that's what it was. I had a guy sitting sitting down across from me one time in my office, and the doctrine of his church said that once you are saved, you do not sin ever again. That was the doctrine of his church. And I asked, and you know why he was in my office? Because the pastor's son. This was a big church. The pastor's son, who was next in line to be pastor of that church, already doing ministry in that church, had been with this man's wife. And I said to him, and he was just sobbing and crying, and, and I said to him, and he came all the way up from Texas just to talk with me. This is several years ago. And I, and I said to him, I said, your church teaches that once you are saved, you don't sin ever again. He said, yeah. I said, how's that working? And he said, he said, Pastor, believe it or not, they had a meeting, and they decided that technically he did not commit adultery, so therefore, and he said, and that's what we do. He admitted to me, he said, that's what we do. He said, anytime any one of us does, according to the Bible, sin, we always find some way around it saying that wasn't really sin. And that's what's going to happen to you. You're either, you're either going to be honest or you're going to have to lie about it. And then all of a sudden now the stuff that you're doing is not sin. Let me tell you something. If you won't let God cover your sins, you cannot cover your own. Try as you will. You cannot cover your own sins. You cannot cover your own nakedness. Adam and Eve tried it. It didn't work for them. So here is the book of the law. The book of the law is in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant is in the most holy place in the cell 
surrounded by the altar, the laver, and the, um, the gate. All right? So watch this. Let's look at what the New Testament then says. It verifies all of this for us. It verifies the fact that you and I are the tabernacle or the temple, either one. It's that both words are interchangeable with one another. Okay? So watch this. It, 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 literally, whether it was in the wilderness and it was a tent, or it was in Jerusalem and it was a big, massive stone building, it represented what? The dwelling place of God. And there was a temporary building, and there was a permanent building. See it? Watch this. First Corinthians five or Second Corinthians five one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, this one, not that one, that one cannot be dissolved. It's this one. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I love it. I absolutely love that. First of all, look at that. Look at this verse here. Okay? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, think of what's on Baphomet's arm. Salve. In other words, we're going to dissolve the old so we can coagulate the new. And there is God's version of it, and there is Lucifer's version of it. Are you following this? Because the two have contrary ways by which they're going to bring mortals to immortality. God sent forth his only son, made of a woman, made under the law, so that you and I would no longer be condemned to the law. And that's what I'm trusting on. And I know that this tabernacle has to be dissolved. And even if it is dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with what? Hands. A church not built with man's will and man's works and man's hands. A church built by God himself. A, um, a, a body that does not have the genetic manipulation going on in it. We went, we went to yesterday. We have, uh, we have homeschool children in our church. And we started taking some field trips, and we went to the St. Louis Science Center yesterday. And, of course, you know, you see all the junk about evolution and everything like that. And the dinosaurs, you know, they lived 65 million years ago. Bless his heart, one of our kids, while the lady instructor was talking about the dinosaurs, he said, um, my dad says that um, the dinosaurs lived about 6,000 years ago. And I'm just going, woo, yeah, got it right. And then, of course, the young lady said, well, we actually like to rely on science here. And science says it was 65 million years ago. Wrong. Anyway, no genetically modified church, no genetically modified human body, no genetically modified organisms. We have a building of God and house not made with hands. Contrast that then with Freemasonry that says we build the temples. Masonry builds its temples in the hearts of men. It is man-made, not God-made. That's the difference. Building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He then says, 2 Corinthians 5, 4, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. Remember Adam and Eve? but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Think about, watch this, this, look at the language of your King James Bible. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. You know, I went to bed groaning last night. Got out, nice weather, did some yard work. I went to bed groaning last night. Woke up groaning this morning. We live in this tabernacle, and we are burdened right now because gravity, I mean, who among us has not been on a diet this year already? Because we're burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, 
but clothed upon. And I like the language here, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What happens when you put a shirt on? It swallows up your body, doesn't it? Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Life is going to swallow up mortality. Just like having clothes put on our body, it swallows us up. Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Now, let's see here. Hebrews 9, verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which means he always went with blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The high priest was no better than anybody else. Don't you ever forget that. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all, not the Holy of Holies, the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. Did you hear that one, guys? Did you hear that one? I'm finding out that there are multitudes of different theological ideologies that some, for some reason believe that the Old Testament people in the wilderness were saved by law-keeping. And it's not true. It's not true. That could not Make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Could not do it. So this tabernacle, this, uh, follow, follow the illustration here. And, and, those, and, and I want you to hear me out. Those of you who believe that God is going to return Israel to sacrificing little animals for their salvation... Hear me out on this. He's clearly talking about, and we've read verses already, this tabernacle gives place to that tabernacle. Do you see the illustration? In the Old Testament, we had a tabernacle. Where is it now? It doesn't exist. It does not exist. The temple doesn't exist. The tabernacle doesn't exist. Where is it? We don't know where it is. It's gone. It's out of the way. This gives way to this. And there are people believe, the Hebrew roots people believe, that you can go back, that you have to, in order for you really, really, really to be saved like they are, you have to go back to the first tabernacle, and everything that's done is all about the showing of your flesh. That's what they believe. There are others who believe that when God begins to do his work again amongst the people of Israel, that he's going to turn them back then to the works of the law and sacrifice little animals. And so I'm going to ask, ask you all a question. Upon dying and receiving the eternal life tabernacle, who, listening to me, wants to then go back to this one? I don't. And I say this at every funeral that I know that they're born again, they're saved, and that they're in heaven. I say, look, if they could, they wouldn't want to come back here. Not for what they have up there. They would not come back here for anybody. They want you up there, but they don't want to come back down here because they miss you so bad. They want you up there. And the old covenant pertains to this flesh tabernacle, and this tabernacle is going to be dissolved one of these. What's going to happen to my body? I'm going to put it in the ground, and it's literally, literally going to dissolve, isn't it? Literally, it's going to turn back to dust, and no record of it ever being there. That's what's going to happen. So why then, if you believe in the Hebrew roots ideology, why then do you think that you're going to go back you have to go back in order to live right. 
Or why would you say, John Hagee says this, and many others I'm finding out, are trying to tell me that God is going to make Israel go back to the house that's been dissolved. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. God said he had a new covenant for them, not like the old one. You know what the new covenant is? That he's going to put his law in their hearts. They're going to live right. God's going to forgive all their sins. Conditioned upon what? Zero. Go read Deuteronomy 7. You'll find out why God did what he did for Israel. You know why God did what he did for Israel? He said, I love them. Oh, anyway, here, let's look at this one. Hebrews 9.11, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with Monsanto, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. It's not this tabernacle that the perfection comes. It can't. It can't be perfect. I would love, I would love nothing better than to be perfect before my God. And the only thing that I can really actually hope for is to be clothed upon, not naked, not like they were back in the Garden of Eden, not like I was when I was one, but to be clothed upon so that my mortality is swallowed up of victory and righteousness. That's what I can hope for. Not this tabernacle, the next one. Second Peter 1.13, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Peter was saying, I, I, I actually am of, of the age now to where I'm hoping that what Jesus said actually comes true. I want to put off this tabernacle. I want it gone. I want it destroyed. I don't want it to ever come back ever again. That's not what I want. I want the new tabernacle. John 2, 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of what? His body. Now I'm going to show you something something I didn't show you earlier. Let's go back here. You see this structure here? God specifically, let me show you the the scriptures, okay? No, that's not it. Where is it? I thought I had it in here. Anyway, it's in um, Exodus 26. If you want to look this up, Exodus 26, starting in verse 15. God specifically said, on this side, see, on this here, there's no, there's no wall. It's a curtain. It's a door. And on this side here, you have 20 boards. Now, this thing right here is just a skin. Isn't that interesting? It's a skin covering. God didn't, God didn't use palm leaves or wood. He used skin to cover this, to clothe it. Down the north side were exactly 20 boards. They were all exactly 10 cubits tall, and they were, I think, a cubit and a half wide. So it's a pretty big building. So then down on the south wall, you had 20 boards, 10 cubits tall, cubit and a half wide. That's 40. On the back wall, God said, Don't put five, don't put seven, put six there. 20, 40, six. 46 boards with skin on it. What what is this? What is this? That's us. God was signifying to us that this, what, and man, Moses and his team of people had no clue what that was representing. Moses didn't know that he had 46 chromosomes where his DNA was. He didn't know that. David was writing about the book, but 
I mean, he he saw it as a book. He didn't know DNA and chromosomes and and uh, mitochondria. He didn't know any of that stuff. We do now. And now we see it plainly. We see it clearly. So here's the tabernacle, 46. And by the way, this is a picture of New Jerusalem. The temple of God in heaven is not a pyramid. I've had people ask me, Pastor, you think that, you know, that city of four square, do you think that's a pyramid? No, it doesn't. No, 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 it's not. It's a square. How do I know? Because it says square. Not just square on the bottom. It's four square. And the height was the same as the width. It was all equal. And its depth and its height and its length and its breadth was all equal. Pyramids are not equal. They're not this, it's not the same. And I am I am very suspicious of how let me just kind of talk to you for a minute. I'm very suspicious of how it got introduced into some people's thinking that God's kingdom is a pyramid. That's kind of like what you find out about Shekinah. Somebody sent me an email earlier. I'm going to look into it later. I've put it in my Evernotes. Um, a Shekinah conference coming up. We're going to teach you. We're going to have the Shekinah glory. Really? That's because that's God's naked girlfriend. Are you are you sure about that? Oh, it is not. It's right there in the Bible. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's not in the King James. It's not. In the, it's not even in. Well, I don't know if it might be in the Message. It's not in the King James. It's not in the Hebrew. It's not, period. It's not in the Bible. It's in the Kabbalah. It's in the Zohar. Jewish mysticism, Jewish magic and witchcraft. That's what Shekinah is. It's not the Bible. And I want to know how Shekinah got introduced into the Bible or into biblical thought because it's not there. Same way with the pyramid. I want to know who came up with that idea that Jerusalem was a pyramid or is a pyramid or is going to be a pyramid. And you take a look at this. Well, let me put it up here. Now you can take a look at it. God said that the heavens were a picture of the tabernacle, not a pyramid. It is a rectangular box with four sides. 20 20 and 6, 46. That's what it is. So they said, you can't rebuild the temple. We've been 40 and 6 years building this thing. What makes you think that you can do it in three days? But they wist not that he spake of the temple of his body. Let's see if I can find my place again. Here, here Here we go. Here we go. 46. In the 46th book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Don't you know that? Don't you know that? Your body, your flesh, this body, the 46, is the temple of God. And so he says, Ephesians 2, 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. This earthly body is a shadow of the heavenly one, but it's not the real thing. It's not the real thing. Now, remember this. Somebody sent me this here a while back, and I'm just going, oh, I get it. Watch this. DNA Reset. It's a new skin cream product. Okay? Snake oil is what it is. This is is planting in the ideas of people that our DNA needs to be reset. It needs to be altered. It needs to be changed. Move over injectables. Define facial contours. Visibly lift and firm skin with dragon's blood. Dragon's blood. Dragon's DNA. 
Oh, hoggy. The devil doesn't have DNA. Want to bet? Angels have bodies, don't they? Don't they? No, they're spirit. Okay. They have spirit bodies. Or, as the King James Bible says, celestial bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, verse um, 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. If it's a body, it has seed. And then he says in verse 40, there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Celestial bodies are angels, spirits. And if they have a body, um, show me in the Bible, show me in the Bible where any spirit, be it benevolent or malevolent, a good angel or a bad angel, Show me in the Bible where any spirit anywhere, Old Testament, New Testament, looked like a floating cloud of gas. Show it to me. Casper the Friendly Ghost has one. And maybe that's where your concept of what ghosts and spirits are and they look like, but that's not true. That's not real. Every place. Think about what Ezekiel saw. What did John see? Did John see? Yes. And underneath the uh, sea of glass was four floating wads of shapeless gas entities. Plasma. That's what they were. That's not what he said. He said they had bodies. They had feet. They had wings. They had heads. They could speak. They ceased not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They had bodies. And bodies have, according to 1 Corinthians, they have seed. DNA. Dragon's blood is going to reset the DNA. So, and then here's them. The new bee venom. What do bees do? Sting. What does the sting represent? Paul said the sting of death is sin. What do the uh, locusts come out? The scorpions do. What do they do when they come out in Revelation 9? They sting. And the question is, if we have this tabernacle and masonry says that we're going to rebuild the temples, we are going to do it with our hands because that's what we masons do. We build temples with our hands and we use the working tools of masonry to do it. And all of those working tools have symbolic ideas behind it. And they all go to an idea that heaven and what's in the heaven is going to converge with what's in the earth. I just watched Thor, the uh, dark world or something like that. And it was all about the convergence of the nine. Remember what the number nine means? Number nine means you're having a baby. You're bearing fruit. Okay? That's what it was. It was all about the convergence, the verge, everything coming together. Okay? So does the Bible teach us that DNA is going to be reset, that it's going to be altered, that it's going to be changed? Absolutely. The temple is going to be not fixed up. They're not just going to fix up the temples. They're going to rebuild them. So here's this article. Jaw-dropping breakthrough hailed as landmark in fight against hereditary diseases as CRISPR technique heralds genetic revolution. I don't know if you can read this caption, but it says a brave new world of genome editing. So here is your DNA. See the four things here? Adenine, guidine, cytosine, thiamine. We're going to take those. We're going to unzip them. We're going to insertion of extra DNA. You see this right here? 
We're going to break it apart. We're going to take this little piece of DNA. We're going to insert it right here. And the scientists are all patting themselves on the back, hooping and hollering, making big, big, big scenes everywhere. Why? Because they now know how to edit the book. They know how to dumb it down, don't they? So consider this, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. What is it? And some people have varying ideas on it, and I, I, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be nice, because I, I know some of you are very health-conscious, health-aware, health-motivated. Uh, I am trying to be. I really am. I'm trying to be. Um, but people say, Hoggard, you're not supposed to eat that. Isn't that defiling your temple? No. No, it's not. Well, yeah, it is. You know, that you're eating that. It's like poison, and you're, you're putting that in your drink, and you're eating that, and you're swallowing it, and you're breathing that in. It's defiling your temple. No, it's not. Not the way God said. God said that it's not what goes in your body that defiles you. It's what comes out. You think about that. Uh, all you cigarette smokers out there. That doesn't defile it. Blowing it out does. That's just a little. Anyway. Um, yeah, you can suck cigarettes. You just can't exhale ever. Anyway, you know I'm kidding. But he said that our temple is defiled. Not by what we eat, not by what we drink. Because Jesus promised the disciples that if you if you drink poison, if you happen to he didn't command them to drink poison. He said, if you do it, it I won't let it harm you. Do we not believe the words of the scriptures? I do. I believe it. So what is it that comes out of us that defiles the temple? How does the temple get defiled. The Bible has the answer for it. What agreement hath the temple of God with? I I used to, in my mind, I've caught myself doing this. I would change this verse. What agreement hath the temple of God with the temple of idols? I would say that. I have said it before. Nobody's ever caught me so far, but I've said it ignorantly, stupidly. Because that's not what it says. It doesn't say what agreement hath the temple of God with the temple of idols. It says what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. None. So watch this. What is defiling the temple? It's when you put an idol in the temple. Watch this. Watch this. Manasseh. You remember Manasseh? Okay. Here's what Manasseh did. I'm not done. Hang on. I got to stop this. Stop playing the music. I don't want the music. There. See how easy that was? Manasseh in 2 Kings set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Second Chronicles 33 tells you a little different perspective of the story. And he said he set a carved image, the idol which he had made. What are they going to do in Revelation 13? What does the false prophet cause everybody to do? Make an image. So he took Manasseh, who was uh, reigned 55 years. That's an interesting number. Um, he made an idol and he put it where? Where God's supposed to be. Now, the temple. And you can, you can look at it. You trace it down. Manasseh 
tripped God's trigger. That's what he did. Because after that, it went downhill fast, and they ended up in Babylonian captivity. Why? Because Manasseh defiled the temple. So let me show you a picture of this. Let me show you what it looks like to have an idol inside of your temple. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God sitteth where? Where is he sitting? And what is that? What is, just do this. Just look at the Bible, and what does the Bible tell you the temple of God is? You see, if they, if they, build, if they build a building, like, um, let, me, let me show you this. Do you think that would ever be called the temple of God? No. Do you think that? This is a temple with 46 columns, 36 on the outside, 10 hidden ones on the inside. Get it? With a, with a dead statue in it. This is the temple. This is a house, 46 chromosomes, that has an idol in it. Do you think this is ever called the temple of God? No. What about the Parthenon? Whether it's in Greece or I think this is uh, Nashville or somewhere in Tennessee, has this? do you think this is ever called the temple of God? No. So if they build a house, a, you know, a regular house, and put an idol in it, is that? I don't think so. I think that the Bible is telling us that the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, literally, literally, is going to sit here in the four-chamber heart. The heart is where the seat of man's being is. The heart right now, this is where my Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my Jesus, my God resides in me. And he's on the throne of my life. And I want no other king. But we've got nearly 7 billion people on this planet that are absolutely going to roll over and say, come live inside of me, Baal, man of sin, son of perdition. That's what they're going to do. I think that the way that the beast, the man of sin, has absolute total control over everybody in the world is that he literally is sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Study all the people that Jesus encountered that were um, possessed of devils. Did they have any control over themselves? No. And this is like the ultimate of devil possession. This literally is a devil, the angel of the bottomless pit, the king of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer, the Syrian, the beast, the Antichrist. All of these names apply to the same figure, the same person. I believe that he literally is going to reign on the inside. People are going to defile their temple by setting the carved image in their heart. Um, I haven't read any emails. I'm just curious as to what you've got to say. Uh, Georgia says, this is twice on PMO that I have stated that I don't care about my body. I don't know that I said it that way. I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I absolutely, and I'll make sure that you understand exactly what I'm saying. I've said earlier today that I'm at the time of my life, Lisa and I both, sweetie pie, we're at the time of our life where we have to do things differently with this body because it's not working very well. And as long as I am going to be alive, I am going to, I'm going to try to maintain what I've got. I know that the older I get, it's going to get worse. So we're talking about exercise. We're talking about you know changing our foods, and we're talking about all kinds of things. To that extent, Georgia, 
to that extent, I am all in favor of making my day go by a little bit easier because I'm not in so much body pain. I'm, I'm not sick all the time. But I will say this. This body that I reside in is full of iniquity and full of sin. And if I were given, I'm like Paul, if I were given the option, I'm not sure what I would do of either going to heaven today or staying here. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if I go to heaven today, I won't miss this. Not for a second. And there is no seconds in heaven. It's all eternity. If I stay here, it's not that so I can enjoy a healthy life because I don't care. If I stay here, it's to keep preaching and teaching and singing and trying to help people in their life. That's what I'm here for. And if eating a salad as opposed to an all-beef hot dog helps that along better, I'm all for it. But the moment that I'm that God ordains for me to give up this body, that's when I'm going, not a minute later and not a minute earlier. That's what I believe. That's what the Bible teaches us. So I hope that clears that up. I hope it does. Uh, let's see here. What can we do? What can we do? We can do this. Pastor Mike, starting in the 40th chapter of Ezekiel, there is a very detailed description of a temple and sacrifices that it seems all living during the millennium will participate in. The Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sin, so these won't either, but maybe they will be done as a memorial of what Christ accomplished at the cross. Kathy, that's not even the thing either. And I have a suggestion for you, okay? Something that, that you can study. First of all, write this down. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. Write this down. Second Peter, no, excuse me, First Peter chapter 2, like the first eight, nine verses. Okay, I want you to study that. I want you to look at what it says. I want you to study, especially in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, uh, in the Psalms. Study what how God said his enemies were like. In one place in the Psalms, he said his enemies were as the fat of lambs. Let me ask you a question. We know that there's earthly animals that they sacrificed in the earthly tabernacle. Are there spiritual beasts that need to be slain? Think about that. All right? Just study the scriptures. And they're caught... They're called oxen, and they're called, they're called uh, lambs. The false prophet has horns of a lamb. That's not just a metaphor. It's, I think it's real. Anyway, you study that out, and um, sorry if I made anybody mad today. I don't like making people mad. Uh, I don't like people making me mad. And, uh, but I, I, if, if nothing else, provoke you to study God's Word, and not everybody else's books and websites, okay? Study God's Word, and don't read somebody else's websites and get your doctrine, your ideas, your theology, your eschatology from that. You get it from the pure Word of God, all right? I love you. See ya.